Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Professor Hall, and as you can see next to me, today we are talking about Zelda Fitzgerald. We are going to talk in this first lecture about her family background and her life um, and give you guys a little bit of uh, biography about the author. And then next time we will be talking about her published work, Save Me the Waltz, which is, of course, the book that we'll be looking at for this course. Um, and we will talk next time about how a lot of this biography comes out in her writing because it's kind of a semi-autobiographical novel although it's fictionalized too at the same time. So let's get started. Um, I want to start with her family background because it's a little bit complicated and there are some controversies. And I think the controversies kind of play into each other a little bit. So basically, um, Zelda is born as Zelda Sayer um, to a fairly prominent family in Montgomery, Alabama in 1900. Um, her mother, Minnie uh, Minerva, is 40 at the time of her birth. So her mother was born in 1860. Um, her father, Anthony Dickinson Sayer was a uh, justice. He was a judge and he was born in 1858. So her family being a prominent wealthy family in the South, um, her parents being born around the time of the Civil War. Um, she had other family members who would have still been alive at the time of her birth and throughout her childhood that would have lived through the Civil War. And... <sighs> They were, uh, being from Alabama, on the Confederacy side of that war, um, and she had an uncle, at least, that is confirmed that he was a um, a person who was, it gets complicated, but basically he was high up in the Ku Klux Klan, which was, um, now we would call it a terrorist organization, basically, but it did come about really after the Reconstruction period in the South, and especially in the period during which the Jim Crow laws were being put into place um, to try to get those laws into place and to kind of terrorize the, the African Americans who had newly found their freedom. So she has a very complicated relationship with her uh the place of her birth and we're gonna see that in the novel and we'll talk a little bit about that next time but there are some accusations later on uh from scholars that her father um may have sexually abused her and this is because and we'll see this when we talk about f scott fitzgerald's book um f scott fitzgerald basically has a character based on his wife and that character in one particular book, he had a, a number of things where he kind of used Zelda as a muse. But in that particular book, he um, he comes to the realization that this woman's father has been abusing her. So the thing is that um, it is possible that that was a biographical detail of Zelda's. It's also, I think, entirely possible that it's just made up. And it's also entirely possible that um, at this point in time, a lot of writers are using things symbolically when talking about the South to show a lot of the problems that are going on in the South during this period of reconstruction and then later in the 1930s during the depression when the South is really struggling, um, some of the Southern states are really struggling um, a lot more than some of the more prosperous areas of the North, which certainly were hit by the depression, but not as much as um, some of the agrarian um, states, which we talked about in, a, in another lecture as well when the Dust Bowl hit and uh, the, the drought and all of that kind of thing. So is it possible that she was abused? Yes, there's nothing in it in this book that we're going to be looking at, but we'll talk about why that is, I think, later on as well. Um, at any rate, her, um, her family was rather prominent and throughout her childhood, she seems to be 
rather spoiled and kind of getting everything she wants. And in her teenage years, much to the chagrin of her um, her father, she begins to have uh, quite a bit of scandal because she's basically a socialite and um, running around. And uh, there's a very famous story where she was uh, interested in, in a few different activities um, throughout her life. She's kind of looking for this place to have creative output and also um, physical exercise, which is interesting to me because we really have at this point um, women starting to become involved in sport. And as the clothing changes in the, into the 1920s, um, especially this starts to come up that women can play golf and women can swim because they're not corseted up and they don't have huge bustles on their butts, um, that their clothing, it's not just that their skirts are shorter, um, that the hemlines kind of drift up past the ankle, as we kind of see a, a, a little bit later with the flappers, but that things are a little bit looser as well. So she gets involved with swimming, which was becoming popular for women at the time. There's a very famous swimmer, Kellerman, who um, writes this book for women, and it seems to have inspired Zelda to, to, to take up the sport of swimming. But she um, would do things like she, she wore a flesh-colored bathing suit and went into the town fountain and there were that's in like really the center of town so there are these stories that she's like very scandalously skinny dipping in in the middle of town and riding through town naked well in fact she was not naked but she was almost naked in terms of how they would have thought of it in the late 19 uh teens and early 1920s and she was apparently there's this one story that she was in a jalopy. She's a car that doesn't have a top on it. Right. It's kind of a little bit more rickety and uh, with her friends driving and she was in the back seat saying, oh, these are all of my jellies, um, referring to a, a name for all of her suitors, which would have been uh, at the time a little slang term that the kids were calling jelly beans. If you had a lot of suitors, um, her husband, Scott later on she calls him scott so that's how we will refer to him as i said um so later on scott writes a short story uh, about jelly beans and and somebody who has a number of suitors like she did so um a lot of suitors a lot of a lot of men and i want to kind of this would not have been unusual at the time really courtship rituals start to change and, and dating starts to change for younger people um, around this time, mostly because of the automobile. It allows this teenage culture and kind of subculture to, to arise up because instead of riding your horse many, many miles and visiting uh, your your one true love and sitting on the front porch with them and, um, and having a very... Um, uh, a very quiet courtship, maybe taking them for a ride or going into town, maybe once or twice, you now have the ability to ride around with groups of people and to go various places and to get into all sorts of trouble, right? So um, it also, though, would not have been unusual to not have a serious Sorry, everyone. My camera kind of blipped out on me there for a second. Um, it wouldn't have been a have a, a serious um, relationship at that point. Um, what would happen really with courting is that a person would be seeing um, a number of people kind of casually before kind of limiting it down. Um, and so I think... Though that in Zelda's case, it's very clear from her letters and things that she said later that she is having sexual relations with people um, prior to her meeting F. Scott Fitzgerald and possibly um, even after meeting him because they have kind of an on and again, off again relationship. And for a while, they're both seeing multiple people and having kind of an open relationship. 
we talked about in a previous lecture, um, those types of values were changing around this point in time. And um, the two of them are a little bit um, hedonists, basically, um, and not interested in the more traditional values that their parents probably would have held. So <laughs> because of all those things, um, because of all those things, he calls her the first flapper that she is interested in uh, drinking and partying and having a, a good old time dancing on um, dancing on bars and tabletops and um, becoming friends with future Hollywood stars and going along in um, going to dances and going to jazz clubs and all of those types of things. So she meets F. Scott Fitzgerald in 1918. So if you remember, she was born in 1900 and he was born in 1896. So he's about four years older than she is. Um, so his early 20s and for her, she's 18. Um, again, a little bit unusual for a woman that age to have already had some sexual relationships, especially at that time. Um, but they meet at a country club and he at the, at that point is, um, dating a, another socialite, an heiress, um, Geneva or Jenny King. And she has basically just rejected him because he's, kind of not from any type of prominent family and doesn't seem to have many prospects. He wants to be a writer, but he hasn't written anything yet. He hasn't had anything published and he's already into his early twenties. So he joined the military and he's volunteering uh, during this would have been, of course, world war one, which we talked about. Um, he's awaiting deployment to the Western front and at this point is basically stationed at this um, Camp Sheridan outside of Montgomery. So that is how they meet. And as I said, they kind of the on again, off again relationship. She's dating a number of people. Um, there is to the understanding that he will probably be deployed. He ended up not being deployed, at least not into Europe, because um, he was sent somewhere else for a bit of time and then the war ended. Um, so they get engaged, even though she has some hesitation um, and he's just been uh, freshly dumped again by this other socialite. Uh, th she gets married and like three days later he proposes to Zelda. So that's about the state of mind that he was in. And that's about, to me, that kind of sums up their whole relationship. Um, I think that people at the time painted it like it was this very like fast paced and fast moving kind of um, thing and very glamorous. And they were, they basically did become celebrities. But today, we would just say that they were toxic and that they probably should not have been together or that they should have really gotten therapy. Um, so what happens is this. They get engaged. Um, he becomes basically kind of obsessed with her and she's kind of like his muse. He writes this book. Um, he submits it for publication and it's rejected. Now, if you are a writer, you have been rejected, just know so was F. Scott Fitzgerald. That should give you a little bit of comfort. Um, but basically, she thinks, okay, I, I have to say that I'm basically, I would say that she feels like she lives a certain type of lifestyle to which she has become accustomed, and he's not going to be able to provide to keep her in that lifestyle. Basically, he's not wealthy enough for her. And she still has a number of other people who are kind of interested in her, right? And so because of that, she um, she breaks off the engagement. And she becomes what he later says is kind of like sexually reckless, um, that she's been... Um, 
fooling around with many different people. Um, at one time, he's in New York City, and apparently they had also still been together. She thought that she was pregnant. He wanted her to take some pills to kind of force an abortion, um, and she refused to do so. And even knowing that it might bring scandal on her and her family, um, especially, again, we're talking about 1919, right? So um, this is not a time when when pregnancy outside of wedlock would have been accepted. So... At any rate, um, he revises the novel, he sells the novel, and it becomes an instant success when he sells it to the publisher and and has a publishing deal. Um, He goes back to her and she agrees to marry him. The problem is that by this point, she's he basically later will say that he was no longer in love with her and he didn't really realize it until it was kind of too late. So now they're married and what seems to happen, and we're going to see this in the book as well, because as I said, it's autobiographical, at least somewhat. Um, They start going flitting around kind of from place to place. So they go to New York for a while they go back down south for a bit. They go to Paris and they're they're hanging out with Hemingway and Gertrude Stein and that whole crowd. They go to Italy and they're vacationing um, and all of this kind of thing. And again, um, I think that from the outside, they were celebrities. They were kind of the type of people, you know, now you might read about like the Kardashians or something, I guess, um, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, they're that kind of celebrity. People want to know what they're doing, and they they um, have huge arguments at parties sometimes, and they're um, she's searching for some kind of meaning in her life, and he's drinking more and more. Um, they also have various financial troubles because they're just spending money here and there. Um, and they have a number of servants as well. Zelda had grown up with servants in her home. As I said, this is uh, really only 40 years or so after the Civil War. And so um, you have a number of servants in the home, some of whom used to be slaves. It seems like um, that they stayed with the family and then and then were paid as servants. But they, they employ servants again because she can't really cook or clean or any of those types of things. And they have money. And that's what you do when you have money. Um, so very famously, a, a magazine asked her for a recipe because she was a famous woman and known mostly at that point as the wife and muse of the the author who's, you know, trying to write the great American novel and possibly doing so successfully. So here's what she writes. Um, see if there is any bacon. And if there is, ask the cook which pan to fry it in. Then ask if there are any eggs. And if so, try to persuade the cook to poach two of them. It's better not to attempt toast, as it burns very easily. <laughs> so... <laughs> recipe is just like oh this little ironic quippy kind of thing like just ask the servants to do it all for you um so that's her marriage they have a daughter who they name scotty which i think is quite interesting um given the fact that uh, his name is or he goes by scott at least um and people think at first it might be a publicity stunt but it is not um but she really begins at this point her her mental health struggles become more and more apparent now later she's given a diagnosis of schizophrenia i think that if she were alive today possibly um she would be diagnosed with something like bipolar disorder possibly borderline personality disorder i can't say for sure um i think too that the um the treatments at that point kind of made her worse so we'll we'll talk about that in a moment but at any rate while she's she so she has scotty she doesn't really seem to be um meant to really be a mother and i I, it seems like really 
not so much involved as much in her daughter's life, at least not when she is a child. So she tries for a while. She goes back to ballet, which she had done in childhood. And you can tell, and this is going to be seen in the book too, but you can really tell that she's struggling to just find herself and figure out like who she is as a person outside of just being F. Scott Fitzgerald's wife. Um, she's having affairs, he's having affairs, she's not finding out her identity in these other men, um, and so then she goes to ballet, um, which, as I said, she had done as a child, but the ballet that she's practicing is intense, um, and it is really obsessive. I mean, she's, she's becoming kind of erratic, and decides she's 28 at this point and she thinks that she can become a prima ballerina and be with the Russian ballet and really 28 is older to be a ballerina especially if you haven't gotten your body your physique in that shape by that point um so she's practicing like eight hours a day um with the director of the Philadelphia Ballet and then, um, and again, she has a daughter at this point, right? But who's probably being taken care of by servants. Um, so her mental health issues really pile up at this point because she's just mentally exhausted. Um, a doctor says that she's mad. Her mental health is deteriorating and she's taken to different hospitals for um, observation. In one incident, she tries to um, kill herself, her husband, and her daughter. She's driving the car, and she tries to go over a cliff with the three of them in the car. And it's really at that point that, um, that her husband realizes quite how much treatment she needs. Because, of course, he ha himself has been drinking, and at this point... There's not really treatment for alcoholism except to voluntarily go into a sanitarium for a period of time after which most people relapse. So we don't have addiction treatment the way we have now, 12-step programs, um, other medications to help people, those kind of things. So because they have money, um, she voluntarily goes into these treatment facilities. And I think that people sometimes get this picture of like um, a psychiatric hospital, like in very dark terms. She's not criminally insane, um, regardless of, of the one incident, but she is suffering from like psychosis and, and a mental breakdown. And really the type of sanitarium she was in was more like a rest home where people would like paint and write and and relax and be treated by psychiatrists as well. But um, it was much more focused on relaxation and then certain types of treatments. Like they would sometimes do water treatments where you're in a bath for a very long time. Um, sometimes they would do what we would probably think of now as art therapy. Um, they are though doing things like electroshock therapy and also insulin shock therapy. And that, um, looks more horrific in the movies than it actually is. They put some electrodes on people's heads and, um, and that kind of thing. Sorry about that. So at any rate, around this time, she really starts to write. It seems to me almost with the same frenzy that she had been doing ballet. So um, she has uh, another breakdown when her father is dying and she goes into a hospital again for a second time. So again, she's kind of in and out, in and out. This time she's at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And um, and she begins writing. The writing is 
part of her recovery and part of her therapy and treatment um, where she's supposed to be writing just a couple hours a day. Seems like she (laughs) then got a little bit obsessive with it and started writing more and more and more and um, wrote this book in kind of a a frenzy. Um, We'll talk about the publication history and how the book came to be published and what her husband thought of it later. But basically received very well. Now, I think, um, and I chose it for this class because I think that it does have some merits. I think it's interesting. And I think, especially from a feminist lens, looking back at this woman who is like many of the modernists, like many of the lost generations, searching for self, we have a little bit of experimentation in terms of the structure and the content We have uh, a very interesting evocative style that changes throughout the book. We have uh, a a female character who is lost and a little bit cynical and a little bit alienated as she grows up and, uh, and comes of age. And we have this story about, you know, two people in a a very toxic marriage where both of them are kind of floundering. So I think that it fits quite well within the lens of looking at the themes of the lost generation and and looking at modern writers. I also think that it's been dismissed in part because her husband dismissed it, but her husband was kind of an ass <laughs> in a lot of ways. Sorry for swearing. Um, but they, um, it, as much as she was struggling with mental health, he did not help in many ways. Now, other ways, he did try to help her. He tried to pay for her treatment, make sure that she was doing well. Um, but in other ways, I think he he kind of exacerbated the problem. Um, putting down her work, calling her a, a third-rate writer, um, saying that uh, she had stolen material from him when, when it's very clear from letters and diaries that in many cases the opposite is true um, and that kind of thing. So the book does not go over very well. Um, and again, she's kind of in and out of hospitals throughout this time. And in the 1930s, basically, she's bouncing between hospitals in Um, Baltimore, New York, and then finally Asheville, North Carolina, which is known for being an arts community. At this point, she begins painting, again, looking for some kind of a creative outlet and kind of trying to find her identity. Now, um, Scott sets up a exhibition for her paintings, um, and they are not really well received. I think that they're quite interesting, and I'm going to show you guys a few. Here we go. Um, I'll pop this open so you can see it better. So this is a still life of flowers kind of influenced by the ballet. It's okay. right? (laughs) I really, I could get into the art a little bit more, but what's interesting to me is that here's another picture of nature. So she's got some landscapes and some still lifes. This one's of the Smoky Mountains, which seems to be when she was in Asheville. But What's more interesting to me are some of the things that she does of uh, New York. Um, This is Fifth Avenue, and it shows a real understanding of surrealism and cubism and um, and has a bit of whimsy as well that we've got flowers and hats and um, and gloves and playbills and and uh, the the car here and another car back here all kind of rushing through the city and the city in the background um, and this little sign that says Fifth Avenue just in case you weren't sure where we were <laughs> with a stoplight which would have been kind of newer at the time. Pantheon in Luxembourg. Um, it's interesting seeing her style. This is not unlike some of the the lines and the shapes here are not unlike some of the Art Deco um, architecture of the time. And other painters were doing kind of similar things. If you remember, I showed you guys this before. Um, this is another uh, artist whose name I can't remember right now, but you can see kind of some of those same lines and shapes and the way that the figures are very exaggerated and um, and the the movement 
of the piece. And so I think that that's what she's doing here, but in watercolor, which is also in kind of an interesting medium. Um, here's another one of Central Park, uh, the children playing and the, uh, the <laughs> looks like maybe balloons or bubbles, the trees, the interplay of people and animals and the old and the new that, you know, in this one, we see that too. There's, there are people on horses and horse-drawn carriages alongside um, cars and buses and this jumble of wheels as New York begins to grow and move into um, having more cars. This is a series that she did inspired by Alice in Wonderland, which is sometimes a ballet. So you can see that Alice has um, ballet slippers on here. Um, this very bizarre rendering of the the rabbit and the the mouse and all of that with um, the Mad Hatter here with his hat and moving up to the castle. But again, it it has a bit of whimsy. The red castle, the white castle. Right, we are um, obviously. Um, in the, the second book, <laughs> inspired by chess. And then we have this one, Love One Another, with these people who um, might be male or female and, and at this table with all of these delights and the walls kind of being broken down by this light coming in and um, and all of that. So um, I just wanted to show you that because I think that her art gives, her, gives you a, a really interesting view of um, her psyche and what's going on and all of that kind of thing. So essentially, after a long period of time of being in and out of these um, mental health facilities, she is uh, in North Carolina awaiting shock therapy treatment. She's been sedated for that procedure. Um, she had also been given insulin treatments as well. I mentioned that. Um, the insulin treatments, I think, are really what caused her problems with memory um, and made her conditions such as they were worse. But you have to know, too, like people were doing the best they could at the time. And they had really, by that point, enough money um, to pay for all of this. But by that, by the time that she um, dies, her husband has already um, long since passed. He, he died a number of years before her. And it is 1948. Um, he passed away in 1940. So it's basically money from his estate that is paying for her treatment by that point in time. And she's sedated. Uh, there's a fire in the hospital. And she uh, died in the fire along with a number of other people as well. So her legacy, it's sad to me because I think that for the most part, her legacy is just her marriage to F. Scott Fitzgerald. And though it was a, a large part of her life, you can see I've put it in the middle here um, for a reason, because she was a person outside of that marriage as well. And I think really struggled with how to be a person outside of that marriage, which you can understand given the fact that they met when she was 18 years old. Um, so quite, quite young and became celebrities fairly early on in a culture that was just starting to have celebrities um, that we we saw people who were radio stars and TV stars and stars of the literary world and the art world in a way that really people were not celebrities like in the 1800s and and very early um, uh, early 1900s really before that we don't have so much celebrity culture so trying to live a life in the public eye um, with a man who's an alcoholic who at various times supports your career and belittles your career, um, having mental health struggles, wanting to, it seems, kind of have an identity outside of being just a wife and a mother um, and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, and that, I think, really...
comes across in her book. And that's what we're going to be talking about next time. Um, so it's something that I'd like you to look for in the book, really um, the most pervasive theme, this idea of femininity and um, a woman searching for her identity and a sense of self in a generation that's lost. So that's what we'll talk about more next time. Thanks, everyone.